Vibrational Revelations. I'm Elena. I am Alejandro. And today we have a very special guest, Stefan Schwartz, who has done tremendous amount of research over the last 40 years into consciousness, the nature of our reality, re regardless of time and space. Now, Stefan has also published more than 250 technical reports, papers, academic book chapters, prefaces, and introductions. Wow. He's a scientist, futurist, award-winning author of both fiction and nonfiction, co-founder of the Society of Anthropology of Consciousness, the Association of Post-Materialistic Science, the Society of Consciousness Studies, a distinguished associate scholar at California Institute for Human Science, distinguished consulting faculty of Saybrook University and Bile Foundation fellow. He's a columnist for the journal Explore, and editor of the daily web publication SchwartzReport.net, in both of which he covers the trends that are affecting the future. So it brings us into today's episode, which is the future of humanity. And uh, we were introduced to your work actually what, over a little over a month ago after we posted several episodes on different generations and the reading that we did about the year actually we did it a couple of years ago a vibrational frequency analysis of humanity the year of 2045 and year 2046 mm -hmm. so we look forward to hearing what you've collected as data because you're an investigator into the data that you've been collecting for many many years and thank you so much for being here with us today my pleasure I hope I didn't miss anything. There's a big, a lot to cover for, for the bio. Whatever. Okay. So you work, you've organized the remote viewers group. I don't know how, how many years ago, but this is something that you've been tracking, right? As statistically with what uh, the remote viewers have been showing. And I'm curious to see what are some of the findings that you've had discovered over 40 years now through the investigation of remote viewing and perhaps you can touch upon for those people that have no idea what is remote viewing let's start there and how did you get into it mm -hmm. well i got into it by creating it i'm one of the small group of people who created remote viewing uh, i started doing it in 1968 in those days i called it distant viewing it's a, uh, the term remote viewing was coined by Ingo Swan. It's a terrible term, as is distant viewing. It just shows the state of our um, naivete back in the early 70s. Um, I got interested in this as a result of reading all of the Edgar Cayce readings, because in a sense, Edgar Cayce is the best documented uh, and most accurate remote viewer in recorded history. But remote viewing has been around for thousands of years. The oldest remote viewing can be found in the 46th chapter of Herodotus's Histories of the World, which dates to the 5th century BCE, in which he describes a remote viewing that's done exactly as we would do it today. But in any case, I got interested relative to what you're interested in. Um, I left, I was in government um, for a number of years. Uh, was uh, One of the posts that I held was special assistant to the chief of naval operations. And I was part of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Secretary of Defense discussion group on innovation technology in the future. And I also did some work over at the National Security Council. And so when I left government in 1976, what really concerned me was, were we going to have a nuclear war? Because I had a young daughter and I was very concerned about what her life and future would be like. And I had already begun, as I say, I started in 1968 to do experiments. I'm an experimentalist. The other thing I should tell you about me is that I am a data person. I am only interested in objectively verifiable data. I'm not a theoretician. I'm not a philosopher. I'm not a speculator. I just deal with data. And um, so in 1978, uh, I 
decided I would begin a project to get people to remote view the same day in the future that I did the experiment with them only in the year 2050. And uh, my, as I say, my concern was, is there going to be a nuclear war? And so when I asked them that question, the remote viewers, and I interviewed them each individually or sometimes in groups, although they responded individually, and there were eventually 4,000 people involved, um, and people all over the all over the world, uh, Japan, uh, Jamaica, Russia, Germany, France, uh, Turkey, the United States, Canada. Um, when I asked them about the nuclear war, uh, because that was what concerned me, they said, "No, there's not a nuclear war." And I said, well, then the world must be safer. And they said to me, oh, no, the world is not safer. It is much more dangerous. And I said, really, why? And they said, because of terrorism. And in 1978, when I started this, 79, the only terrorism that was going on was the fight between the Roman Catholics and the Protestants in Ireland. So the idea that terrorism would become a world issue, I just I couldn't even imagine it, to tell you the truth. But of course, it's exactly how things have developed. Another one of the things that I mentioned to them was I asked them to talk about health care because I that's a subject I've been following for many years, writing about. And they said to me, well, health care is very different. And I said, oh, well, then are people, are everything healthier? And, and they said, well, people are healthier, but there are also these pandemics. Mm -hmm. And I said, pandemics? Because the only pandemic I could think of was the Black Plague or the Spanish flu in 1918. So I just, I could, pandemics? And they said, yes. Uh, the first one will be a blood disease which crosses over from humans to primates. Uh, and it'll come out of Africa and it's going to kill millions of people. And I went around to a friend of mine who was the a deputy director of National Institutes of Health. And I said, do you know anything about a blood disease that could cross over from primates to humans and has the potential to kill millions of people? And he said, no, <laughs> no, that's just nonsense. And uh, whatever it is you're smoking, quit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because that's just silly. But of course, in 1981, AIDS emerges and goes on to kill 35 million people. And mm -hmm. then we have uh, uh, SARS, and then we have H5N1, and now we're in, you know, we're doing COVID. And I believe we're going to have a number of other pandemics in the, every few years because as climate change goes on, the viruses and bacteria which cause pandemics are going to mutate to accommodate for the change circumstances of climate change. And we're not going to have any resistance to these things, just as we had no resistance for COVID. And so I suspect we're going to be seeing a number of pandemics. Anyway, I know that from all of my archaeological remote viewing research and the other research done at other labs at Princeton and at SRI, that we expect to see about 35 to 40 percent of the information can't be evaluated. Not, not that it's wrong necessarily, but you can't evaluate it. So if I said um, someone who was in a car accident that as they hit the other car hit them, they were thinking about something at their work. Well, unless they wrote that down somewhere or told somebody, um, there's no way to evaluate it. It could be correct, but you just can't evaluate it. So you just there's no way to know. Uh, but in any case, so 35 to 40 percent, you just you just don't know. Of the remaining percentage. Um, we expect to see between 75 and 85 percent of the information be correct. And that, in fact, is how it is turning out. 
uh, do the Schwartz Report, uh, SchwartzReport.net, which is a daily publication covering trends which are shaping the future. And one of the things that I do is I'm constantly looking for objectively verifiable data that either confirms or denies the projections that the remote viewers are providing. And so, for instance, as I just gave you two examples, uh, but there are many others, um, I have uh, what I think is a pretty clear idea of what the future is going to look like. Uh, interesting, you mentioned the 2040 to 2046, whatever it was. Um, it's clear to me from the data, and I, I, I carried on the 2050 project from tw 1978 to 1991, and then in 2018, I picked up and began doing 2060 to see what the difference was between 50 and 60. And um, what became clear to me was that, particularly in the 60 data, and there are about 2,000 people involved with that, is that something really dramatic occurs between 2040 and 2045 that fundamentally changes uh, world culture. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that actually that is a, I can't tell exactly, I'm still doing the analysis of the data. I've got 10,000 pages of data to analyze. But I think it is actually a confluence of trends. One is that the end of the internal combustion engine, the end of carbon vehicles, carbon powered vehicles, that's part of it. Pandemics, I think, is another part of it. Climate change is a huge part of it. Um, changes in the geopol geopolitics of the world is part of it. Changes in the political structure of the United States is another part of it. But between 2040 and 2045, it's a very dramatic change. Uh, it's interesting, the 2060s, talk about this, but they generally say, but we're on the other side of it now. So it takes place between 2040, 2045. So that's only 18 years in the future uh, when it starts. Um, and exactly how we come out on the other side, that's what I'm beginning to do analysis of now. Mm. Fascinating, you know. For us, what we we have seen with with the data that we're we're working with is the big shift happens the year twenty forty five, and we, we, we've been yeah we've been tracking the collective consciousness of humanity, and and there is that massive shift that happens for the first time, in probably from the beginning of humanity. Mm -hmm. How are you collecting the data? So we're using scalar wave technology tracking what happens with the collective consciousness and the interesting thing is that split the 2045 and 2046 is when the massive change happens of where people could say we're on the other side from a consciousness perspective now we started another project looking at artificial intelligence as well moving into the future and how that will potentially merge with human consciousness and what we're seeing we haven't revealed all of the data yet but we're seeing that that is going to also create a massive impact on uh, the future and i'm wondering if you're seeing that through review you know the remote viewers if they're sharing any of that information as well that somehow that is also going to impact uh, the collective in a way well the artificial intelligence is is a, a, an issue um, it mostly comes out uh, from the data that I'm looking at in the form of um, driverless vehicles and the fact that cash has disappeared functionally, that people pay for everything either with the iris of their eye profile or with uh, something embedded in a and a wrist or a fingertip, uh, some sort of fingertip thing. So uh, AI is definitely an issue. Um, 
it's I, I do not see it as uh, I, I see nothing that says that AI has taken over the world, which a lot of people are worried about. You know, I, I am um, also asking a thousand, I've asked a thousand people to uh, describe the future, not using remote viewing or imagination or intuition, but only on the basis of their intellectual analysis, uh, the rationals, I call them, and I'm comparing how the rationals look compared to the remote viewers, which is quite interesting. But the general trend that I see is that um, people live in smaller communities. Uh, climate change has dramatically caused migrations out of the coastal areas, out of the Southwest and out of the central states because of uh, uh, heat and cataclysmic events like tornadoes. In the southwest, it's because of temperature and lack of water and the coastal and river areas. It's because of too much water. OK, so are they seeing that some of the continents are going to be underwater? Is that what, what's happening? Continents? No, not continents. Some They've of the land. Their, yeah, mm -hmm. I understand the subsidence of coastal areas uh, to some degree. Yes, of course. Uh, when I found Cleopatra's palace in Alexandria, Egypt and the lighthouse of Pharos, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, uh, Mark Anthony's palace, the Ptolemy's pier, uh, uh, pillar, they were all underwater because the African littoral sank about 30 feet. So I'm sure that there will be um, a, de a decline or a sinking of coastal littorals. But what they really talk about is increased water. And of course, if you look at what's happening in the Arctic, which is melting four times faster than predicted, and you see really what that represents and also the Antarctic, uh, you can see that we're going to look at an increase. Well, it depends on who you talk to and what projection, but up to 21 feet. So, uh, I mean, I got into this because I'd never heard of climate change until 1991. But when I would talk to people, if, if say we were in Los Angeles, where my lab was at that time, um, the Mobius lab, uh, I would say to them, you know, if Los Angeles and well, what's Los Angeles like? And they would say, well, it's very different. But of course, the Santa Monica, Manhattan Beach, Hermosa Beach, Newport Beach, they're all uh, the coastal areas all underwater. And so I went to this is in the early 70s, early 80s. I went to uh, one of the leading climatologists in the country and said to him, can you explain to me why the sea rise would be so great that um, that large sections of coastal areas or on the East Coast, for instance, that the that the eastern shore of Maryland, Virginia, uh, Delaware is largely underwater, that Florida, where you live, is mostly gone. Most of it's going to disappear. Um, Los Angeles, as I said, you know, when I, I went, so I went and asked him and said, can you explain why this would be happening? I mean, I don't get it. And he said, well, I don't get it either. <laughs> uh, because the really, the real serious work with about climate change traces back, as far as I know, to a paper written in the American Scientist in 1991, when they published on ice coring that they had done and and the results that they discovered. Now, of course, it, I mean, everybody understands that not everybody accepts it, but uh, people who care about facts understand it. So uh, we're going to see a quite radical change. And I would say the projections that I see now, not by the remote viewers, but in the science literature, is that about 35 million people are going to be affected and I mean, just think about emptying out Florida. 
because everything from about Miami down is uh, going to be gone. Mm -hmm. So obviously, where are those people going to go? You know, what's going to happen to Key West and Key Largo and all the rest of it? I mean, what happens to those places? And the answer is that people are going to have to move. What's going to happen to places like Phoenix and Tucson, where they're going to have temperatures of over 100 degrees, as high as 125 degrees, maybe 100, 150 days a year. I mean, people aren't going to be able to live like that. So, you know, what's going to happen? They're going to move. Also, the Colorado River is drying up, Lake Mead, Lake Powell. The Great Salt Lake is drying up. And, um, and in the... Uh, in the, I guess the dirt that remains after the Great Salt Lake dries up, they're discovering that all kinds of toxins that got dumped into the lake are are now will become and are already starting, uh, are blown by the dust, and are causing all kinds of lung problems. Mm. So you can see, I mean, as I say, I, I expect that the remote viewing research is of the part that I can evaluate. I can't evaluate yet what people think about something because it hasn't happened yet, but I can look at uh, stuff like the climate change or the migration research that is already coming out in the, in the academic literature. And I can see the beginnings of those trends. I publish them in Schwartz Report every day so I think that the description of 2040, 2050, 2060 that I'm getting from the remote viewers is about 75 to 85% correct. Okay, wow. So what does US look like? And then what does the world look like based on thousands of remote viewers information that you've collected? Well, the United States still exists. Uh, in form, but actual power has devolved down to the states and to groups of states. You can see this happening again. This is already going on. Um, the United States is no longer, it's no longer a unipolar power world. The United States is no longer a leader in, in a great number of things. And you can already see that the Chinese, for instance, have totally outpaced the United States in uh, innovations in technology. They're doing much better with climate change. I mean, it's very important to notice that not a single Republican voted for climate change remediation in this bill that Biden is about to sign. I mean, literally not a single Republican thought that climate change was important enough for their constituents to vote for it. So I think what you're going to see is the blue states and the red states, I call this the great schism trend. Um, if you look at uh, if you look at the red states in almost every social outcome uh, that you can think of, um, maternal mortality, infant mortality, um, literacy, obesity, heart disease, cancer, incarceration, literacy, in numerous, uh, numera numeracy. Um, the red states are notably inferior to the blue states because the Republican choice, and I, this is not a partisan, I, by the way, I'm not interested in partisan politics. I have only one interest, and that is what fosters well-being. I wrote a book about this called The Eight Laws of Change, about how individuals and small groups can change the course of history. I'm concerned, and my interest and focus is what fosters well-being. And I encourage people to make choices that do that because it gets down to individual choices. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, I, I agree. Yes. It comes down to freedom of choice, definitely is extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. And what we have um, gathered uh, as 
uh, our findings state that the collective consciousness, which we measure in frequencies, right, uh, is going to increase drastically in 2045 going into 2046. And the collective consciousness for 2045 is going to be 350. This is on the scale from one up to 1000. And in 2046, it's going to be in the 500s, 525. And we assigned that um, a major that, that a major factor of this uh, new findings to the uh, alpha generation. You know? not necessarily uh, the events that could be they can be taking place during those times, as you say that uh, uh, you know awareness of of. Uh, climate change and, and that uh, also the stop of uh, carbon uh, vehicles and and all these new technologies as well, new way of thinking because we are being um, uh, pushed in a way and forced to, to change our thinking so we can adjust to what is uh, taking place, you know, somewhat behind the curtains because as you addressed it earlier, very few uh, are really acknowledging what what is happening, you know, based on the data that you have access to, and the alpha generation. Can can you explain to me what the alpha generation is? Yes, the, those that are being started uh, being born at the year of two thousand thirteen. Twelve. Two thousand twelve. Until two thousand twenty five. And and it's right until two thousand twenty five. So by year two thousand forty six. Uh, they're going to be how old? Uh, I think 20, over 25% of the population is going to be that generation. But Yes, 33 years old by then, those that were born in 2013, yeah. that's yeah. it, right? So uh, that has increased uh, drastically. But we haven't gone into uh, analyzing other uh, parameters. parameters, right? That they, it could be that something else is happening um, outside of of just the level of consciousness and awareness of, of humanity uh, during those years. That is imp creating that impact. So not only is it the new generation based on our findings that is creating the massive shift in how uh, it's sh it's shaping the human collective and perhaps how they're, they're perceiving their environment. And of course, it's creating a massive shift for the older generations to also begin to perceive it through a different lens. Right, that change is going to happen, but but it is interesting to also see and navigate through some of the things that you're talking about, uh, an outside outside cataclysmic perhaps events or things that are going to force people to to shift in how they perceive reality and how they're living their lives. Well, you're going to see that change. I mean, it's already happening. You can watch it. I mean, it, we are moving out of the materialist paradigm. Mm -hmm. We are moving into a paradigm, and the only way we're going to get through climate change is to recognize that the Abrahamic thinking of materialism, that is, we have dominion over the earth, it's an exploitable bank account that was left to us by a rich uncle, as it were, that uh, that doesn't work. We, we are going to have, the change in consciousness is going to be that people recognize that consciousness is causal and fundamental and that we live in a matrix of consciousness. We don't dominate it. We only are a part of it. And the choices that we make that affect the rest of the matrix come back to affect us. I mean, you can see this in the failure of, um, of chemical industrial agriculture. Uh, you can see it in the collapse of the ecosystems of the ocean. Uh, you can see it in in almost anything you look at, uh, the consciousness is going to change because people are going to have to recognize that consciousness is causal and fundamental. And when you do that, you make very different choices. I mean, you don't do petroleum energy because of what it does. You don't do things which exploit uh, other species because you pay a price for that. And so I think that what you're talking about, uh, again, I'm a data person, is, um, is that 
the culture is going to have to alter because the way we are doing things now doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I mean, it works to make profit. It's wonderful for greed, but it is not good for the long range well-being of either humans or anybody, any other living creature on the planet. So we're going to have to pick different technologies. We're going to have to organize ourselves differently. I mean, for instance, one thing, I don't have a single remote viewer who talks to me about big office buildings. You know, this the basic city, big office towers, blah, 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 all that. I don't hear any of that. Um, I th part of it is I think people may be working from home or they're working in small groups remotely. Uh, it's clear. I mean, if you look at the research that's developing on um, 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 holograms, that people are going to be able to communicate and uh, technologies are developing now. You can see this where all sensory input is stimulated. So you're going to have to, you're going to be able to go into a holographic universe where you can taste and touch and smell whatever it is that, at the other side of it. Um, we're making, and you can see this beginning to happen. I mean, if you look, for instance, at the internal combustion engine, you can see that much of Europe and and large parts of Asia and a few states in the United States have all made the commitment that they will not have carbon powered vehicles on their road by 2040. Mm -hmm. Well, that's going to radically change both the environment and it's going to radically change the whole structure of transportation. So it, it isn't that it, it's it's not as if there are lots of mysteries in this. You can see already in 2022 uh, the beginnings of these trends, which I'm talking about. You can see them beginning to emerge. One of the big trends that I'm concerned about is, uh, is the development of CRISPR technologies, which are going to allow the creation of a new species of human, Homo superior. It's going to come out of Asia almost certainly first because they have different cultural views. And it's going to come out by rich people because they're the ones who can afford it. And it will be gene lining so that it will be passed on from generation to generation. So what happens if, uh, well, there are 27 millionaires in the United States or 20.2 million. Anyway, it's in the millions. I can't at the moment. It's either 27 or 20.2 million. Maybe it's 20.2. Anyway, so those million people, those millionaires will have the money to do it. And what if their, their children are all born with an IQ like Einstein's, the athletic ability of Michael Jordan, and um, they don't get uh, uh, heart disease or cancer or diabetes, for instance? because that's all been genetically altered so that they're not vulnerable to it. Well, what happens when there's a second order of humans, homo superior? And we don't have anybody talking about that except a few ethicists who are looking at the CRISPR technology work. But I think that's going to become a significant issue. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you have seen uh, remote viewers talk about, or is it more based on just your it is currently both? Take place. Mm -hmm. both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they talk about there. Are, there's something different about some of the humans, <clears throat> for instance, they say, and then I look at the scientific research of CRISPR research that's going on, and I see this issue being discussed by medical ethicists, as an example, who are also very concerned about this. Or I'll give you another one. What happens when you genetically manipulate animals and you create what are called chimeras? Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you do if you create an army of gorillas, for instance, mm -hmm. um, who have an adequate IQ and are immensely more powerful than other than humans? I mean, what happens? 
what happens when, as I said, you you have uh, several million people whose children all have radically different beginnings and whose children's children and children's children's children will go on so that you develop two hominid species. I mean, when that happened between the Denisovians and the Neanderthal and Homo sapien, it did not well end well for the Neanderthal or the Denisovians. So what happens to the Homo sapiens? Hmm. Mm -hmm. So what, what do remote viewers see with that as an outcome? Well, I haven't, I, I, I didn't expect it. When I began doing this, I didn't ask that question. So I'm, I'm, I'm part, part of what's going on is I'm developing a, neck, a set of questions for a third iteration mm -hmm. of this research based on the analysis of the first two iterations. So I don't know yet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But we could classify that as, as AI as well, right? Since it's the, they're being well, AI is, well, modified. modified and programmed. I, I do not think, I don't have anybody that tells me that um, the great fear of creating cyborgs who are conscious I, that that's all a materialist misunderstanding of what consciousness is. You mm -hmm. can't create consciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you can create beings or uh, uh, machines which can think about certain things at least as well as humans. They can play chess better than humans, but that's not the same thing as being conscious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. There's there's, there's uh, a confusion often between what about consciousness and being conscious, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Two different things. Yes. So, what are the superpowers uh, in twenty fifty moving forward? China. What? Are, who else is a superpower in the world based on? Well, China is clearly going to be playing a much larger role. Um. The United States is still a, a significant player, but is not the kind of unipolar world we have now. Um, I think based on if you look at the social outcome data, you can see, for instance, that the Norwegian states, uh, Holland, also the Netherlands, because their policies are based on fostering New Zealand, their policies are based on fostering well-being. I think they're going to prosper in a way that that a number of, of countries and a number of states in the United States. Again, if you look at the red state, blue state difference, it's appalling. I mean, if you're a pregnant woman in Mississippi, you would do better to deliver your child in Botswana, Africa, than Mississippi, just based on the maternal mortality data or the infant mortality data. Um, if, you, if you are an elderly person with a disability of some kind, you don't want to live in a red state because it's significantly inferior to blue states. So uh, the question that I, I don't have an answer, I just have a question, is are the red states going to wake up and begin to govern on the basis of well-being, or are they going to continue to this authoritarian anocracy uh, path that they're on now? I mean, from my point of view, Texas is a failed state. Mississippi's a failed state. Louisiana is a failed state. Alabama is a failed state. I mean, if you look, for instance, at the taxes, you see that the for every dollar the red states put into the federal treasury, they take out more than a dollar. And for every dollar a blue state puts in to the treasury, they take out less than a dollar. And so you know, how long are the blue states going to be willing to underwrite the failure of the red states? Or put another way, um, for instance, in Oregon and in Washington, there are counties in both states on the east side of the mountains 
adjacent to Idaho, who want to leave Oregon and Washington and 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 move to be, become part of Idaho. Now, is that going to happen? Well, it could be, because I think there's going to be a dramatic change. I'm not sure at this point, and I didn't ask the question because it never occurred to me that this would occur. Are we going to be a democracy? Now, I'm not at all convinced that we're going to continue to be a democracy. We are heading toward becoming an anocracy. Uh, one of the big drivers, which and there's good news about this, one of the big drivers currently going on in 2022 is that we're becoming a majority minority uh, a country, that is, Caucasians will no longer be the majority population. And that's what's causing so much of the fear that is going on in the United States. Um, it's, it's white people who are frightened that brown and black people are going to become more powerful. I mean, it's a huge deal and it's easily manipulated. If you look at, for instance, the average IQ in the United States is 98 and 34% of the population is between 98 and 85 and 78 is retarded. What you've got is about a third of the country um, are low IQ, not very literate. They, the average reading capability is about sixth grade and they can't figure out a percentage, so they're innumerate. And about 27% have overactive right amygdalas. That's a little gland in your brain that deals with fight or flight. And so they're freaked out. They're in a fear fugue as a result of women becoming uh, more equal. I mean, if I just saw a paper published this morning in, in one of the religious journals, about the in the evangelical uh, community, which is the Protestants, the largest, the Baptists are the largest uh, Protestant uh, subpopulation in the country. They're now under investigation for massive sexual molestation of girls and uh, boys and, and women. And the teaching is that women can't say no to their husbands. So what happens? I think we're going to see now the good news is the 2060s particularly say to me that gender issues and racial issues are no longer a consideration. So apparently we've grown up and gotten past that, but it's going to be very painful for a number of years. Uh, it's clearly driving the election. I mean, you just look at yesterday's uh, outcome of in uh, in the various in Wyoming, for instance, where you have all these election deniers uh, who won, so that's a that's a a an alarm bell about fear mm -hmm. that these people are frightened about something. They're they're going to be they're going to be replaced. I don't know what that means, but in their minds, it means something that is evoking very strong emotions. So I don't quite know yet. Uh, and uh, maybe it's because I didn't ask these questions again, because it never occurred to me. I mean, I was part of the civil rights movement in the fifties. And when we, when Johnson signed the 64 and 65 voting rights act and, and all that, uh, I thought, well, we're through that now we're, we're finished, but no, of course we're not. Wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Um, so there are going to be very radical changes. It is a very different society in 2060. 2050 begins, 2060, it really is on the other side. It's a very different society, which has a very different consciousness because it no longer is based on materialism. It recognizes, for instance, the continuity of consciousness. I mean, you know, you look at near death experiences, for instance, something over 13 million people in the United States alone have had near death experiences and it's radically changed their consciousness. Mm -hmm. So what happens when the culture as a whole now, how many people have to change? Well, we know from in research done in Van Rensselaer Polytech 
that when 10% of any cohort, whether it's a school committee or a church group or a nation, when 10% change their consciousness, the whole cohort has to adjust to that. So how do we get, we have about 334 million people in the United States. So how do we get 33 million people to change their consciousness? Because when they do, the whole country is going to change. Mm -hmm. And that is perhaps the new generation that we're also seeing that is also yeah. born with a, with a different type of consciousness. So yes. the older generations will have to adapt. Yes, they'll have to adjust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. And if you look, for instance, I mean, one of the problems again with the red states is, I mean, I'm sorry, this all sounds political, but it's not. It's just about data. Right, you know, right. it's, you know, I'm, I You're don't a data guy. About, yeah, I don't care about partisanship. It's just data. You've got right. to deal with the data. If you look at that, you can see that um, there is a definite movement amongst the, in the red states to to basically degrade education so that it's not really an educating process. It's an indoctrination process, sort of. It's what they do in North Korea, for instance, is teach everybody that Kim Jong Un is, uh, you know, is God. Uh, so in the red states, they're degrading. They're taking the books out of the library. They're not allowing teachers to talk about slavery properly. So what's going to happen is the red states are going to get dimmer intellectually and in, in education. The blue states are going to get better. And what happens between those states? The red states are armed to the teeth. We have more guns than people in the United States. We have more gun deaths and injuries and gun suicides than any country on earth. What happens when that becomes an unsustainable crisis? Do these people become violent? because that's what we're beginning to see. Or uh, does something wake them up? Do we finally wake up? I mean, if, if Uvalde, Texas didn't wake us up about schools, I don't know what it would take. But clearly, we have these ongoing trends which we're dealing with. And the 2060s basically described this as most of this gets resolved. And again, because of the change in consciousness. Mm -hmm. And we have seen uh, or noticed through his, throughout history that pain is, is a very impo important factor, right? For, for yeah. people to actually wake up and, and, and feel like it, it is time uh, for change. Yeah. But it, really does, it hasn't lasted, apparently, uh, since eons. You know, humanity hasn't learned. So this is yeah. going to be a very interesting shift because, again, because of what we're seeing this new new type of humans that are coming through even though i know you said there is a concern with the crispr uh what are you calling these other humans homo uh, superior homo superiors i don't think they'll be superior because ultimately it's a state of consciousness and the compassion and the kindness that is going to right superior well, I, I hope that i hope that is true it's certainly being more intelligent does not make you a more compassionate and moral yes, human. Exactly, exactly. But if you can combine increased intelligence with greater compassion, then interesting things happen. Yes, uh -huh. that's Increase true. their emotional quotient. Yes. Yeah. More than the yeah. IQ itself, right? Yeah, exactly. Yes, mm -hmm. that's true. That could be done genetically, which is crazy. Um, what, um, uh, what I'm finding is as far as how you do your work, do you have people you gather together in person or is it online? You have a, a zoom and then people just share their data. How do you hold your remote viewing gatherings? Because you still do it to this day. Yeah, no, I, well, I do it all kinds of ways. I do individual interviews. I speak at a conference and say, those people who would like to take part can join me later and they do it individually, but they don't show each other their own data. They only they just give it to me. I do it in Zooms. Um, I do it with specific groups like I did uh, a group of anthropologists to see if 
anthropologists would produce a different outcome descriptions than than uh, sort of general public people. Um, so I do it. I collect the data in a variety of different ways. I have the rationals as well as the intuitive, and I am comparing the differences, if any, between these various populations, because I'm trying to. Uh, when I did the 2050, I didn't do the rationals, and then I began to think, well, but wait a minute, how do I know that these people are not just intellectually? analyzing the answers to my questions and just giving me their analysis. How mm -hmm. do I know it's remote viewing? So I thought, well, the obvious way to do that is to get rationals to do it and see if there's any difference. I'm trying between the 2050s and the 2060s to answer a, an even deeper question. And that is when people describe the future, are they describing a fixed future? Uh, that is, they've looked at all the the, the trends that are coming and and they're describing a fixed future in the in the future, a fixed situation in the future, mm -hmm. or are they describing the highest probability at the moment that I'm asking the question? Mm -hmm. Nobody can answer that question. That's and a I'm great question. That, I yeah, think I'm it hoping is. that out of that data, I'll be able to answer the question. I don't know yet. Because we usually tend to look at the highest probability. Uh -huh. That's how we, we, we narrow it down and, and, uh, and increase our level of accuracy in, in order to feel comfortable enough to, to share it, you know? Yes. Uh, yes. But I've never heard of rationals and intuitive remote viewers. Can you explain? Uh, no, no, that no. no they're, the rationals are not remote viewers. Ah, they're not. Ah, okay. yes, no, no. no, the rationals are asked. They're specifically told, I don't want your imagination. I don't want your fantasies. I don't want your intuitions. I'm not asking you for any of that. What I want is your intellectual, rational assessment of the future. Based on patterns, I'm assuming, right? Based what on it... whatever their intellectual, and I'm looking at groups, scientists, non-scientists, men, women, mm -hmm. to, I, I don't know, you know, I'm, I, but there are people who are specifically being asked not to remote view. Mm -hmm. And then I have another, I have other groups I have one population, for instance, of people who uh, are deeply involved with uh, consciousness activities. Are they describing a different world than remote viewers who were not involved in such things? I'm looking at do meditators describe differently than non meditators? If they meditate, how often do they meditate? Does that make a difference? Does their age make a difference? Does their educational level make a difference? Does where they are in the world make a difference? So I'm looking at all of these variables and um, to see where there are commonalities and where there are differences. Mm -hmm. Would you say there's more commonalities, sorry, than differences? I'm not sure I'm willing to, I'm ready to answer that question yet. Okay. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> I'm going to write a book about this. And in fact, um, I will give you a, a URL for anybody that's interested in the book, which I'm going to write. Please. They can go there and they, I, they'll be notified when the book gets published. Because okay. I get so many people that ask questions like, where can I get the book? Well, I haven't written it yet. But I, if you'll go to that site and th I will send you the URL and um, and ask to be notified when the book is published, then you'll get a notification. Thank you. That's great. Do have you ever remote viewed? Are you a remote? Of course. Viewed? Of course. Yes, of course. And would you find would you say that most of the time your accuracy is really high? Uh, am I a particularly good remote viewer? Yes. Well, I'm, you know, remote viewing is spread through the population like any other skill set. There's about 11% of the population that are really good at it. It's a bell curve. So there's a small group at one end that are really good at it. And there's a small group at the other end that are terrible at it because they overanalyze. And most people fall somewhere in the middle. 
So I would say I'm probably at the high end. I'm not I'm not as good a remote viewer as say um, George McMullen, who was the, who you can go to my personal website stephanaschwartz.com and watch him locate um, a buried building out of 1,200 square kilometers of desert. He locates a bur he and Hella Hammond locate a buried building down to uh, and describe objects in the buried building down to five sixteenths of an inch. And they, um, this is an area that they select for where this building is, which had been previously searched electronically and they reported that there was nothing there. But when they did the actual excavation, there was the building. Amazing. Amazing. I know that remote viewers also are used for crime solving, right? Oh yes, I've done that too. That I know years ago when I actually took a psychic class, uh, the teacher asked me if I would ever want to do that. I said, no, this is definitely not for me. Uh, but I know that that is a really... Oh, yeah. Yeah, big one. Yeah, we did that. We located uh, Queen Elizabeth's racehorse that was stolen. We solved the murder of an Amish girl that was killed and they couldn't... They, they, they tried and tried, they couldn't figure out how it had happened or who had done it. And we solved the crime, told them where the body was. They said, oh no, we've already searched there. I said, go back and look again. They did and they found the body and she was killed exactly as described. Amazing. Fascinating. Yes. <laughs> well, do you have any other questions? I have one. <laughs> Just why Be, being being uh, an avid uh, student of of data, I would say right. Uh, um, when you say that that is also helpful for uh, for doing remote viewing, would, would that help you somehow to know uh, know your data to the team? No, and no, then, you definitely huh? no. The big problem with there, there are two things about remote viewing that are very important. In fact, it's key to the whole business. The first is the ability to attain and sustain intention focused awareness. That's why meditators routinely do better than non meditators. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. The second thing is you have to train yourself not to analyze because your whole education is about analysis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you get rewards at school when you're able to analyze something and give the teacher the answer that he or she wants. That's exactly what you don't want to do in remote viewing. In remote viewing, you just want to report your sense impressions, not try to figure out what it means or anything else. And that's why you see remote viewing courses where they where it's over analytical. There's lots of them. Um, you don't want to do any analysis in remote viewing. You are like a sonar or a ground penetrating radar. You're a sensor system and you are reporting information accessed from non-local consciousness, but you don't want to analyze or try to figure out what it means. That's the researcher's job. That's exactly, exactly what we do, actually. And, right. And, and that's we how, just give the data. Right. That's how one can benefit from the intuitive uh, uh, messages is by separating what's the mind, or what's the mind and what is the actually infinite intelligence flowing, right? Yeah. And by analyzing, we're, we're tend to compare and we bring resistance and that creates a, a, a blockage or it slows down that flow of information that we're trying to retrieve, right? Yep. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Thank you so much for your work. And as you mentioned, this, your website is Stefan Schwartz. StephanAschwartz.com is my personal website. Uh, www.schwartzreport.net is my um, daily publication on trends, uh, which you can check. It's, it's free. I give it away. Uh, you can go to academia.edu or ResearchGate and um, 
You can get all of my papers. There's, I don't know, a couple hundred of them up there. You can go to YouTube, search on my name. You get hundreds of interviews like this one. So I, I, you know, because I believe that the key to the future is fostering well-being and helping people to understand about consciousness, I give everything away as much as I can. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. We appreciate you very much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. And, uh, and we'll post your links below. So whatever it yes. is that you'd like to share, send it over. We'll be sharing that. Uh, I will. I will do that. And um, and you all. Uh, it was my pleasure. Yes, it's likewise. I just ordered your book. Actually, the one that you mentioned at the beginning, the eight, oh, you did? eight laws. Right. Eight laws of change. Of change. Oh, you did. Yes. Oh. I read a little bit about it, and I ordered it. Uh, so I'm looking forward to reading your book. Right. I know you published uh, quite a few, but that's going to be my first one. <laughs> good. All right. Well, that, that's good. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, guys. Well, thank you All very right. much. Likewise. Thank you so much. See you soon. Have a beautiful day. <laughs> bye. Thank Take you. Take care. Bye bye. Now.